welcome to the STOA. Today we have Luke Kemp with us. Uh, Luke is a scholar of existential risk and a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, and he wrote this like awesome article uh, recently for the BBC on uh, something he calls the stomp reflex, uh, basically when governments uh, abuse uh, emergency powers. And it was a really well-written uh, article. Um, and so I invited uh, Luke on. And as people regular to the STOA know, uh, existential risk and the, the overall meta crisis is a theme here that we like to explore. Um, so Luke, uh, his research uh, looks at past uh, civilization collapse and future climate change and emerging technologies to guide the policies of the present. So I'm quite uh, happy for Luke to be here. And so how today's going to work, I'm going to take in Luke in a moment. He's going to share his thoughts on the, the article, the Stomp Reflex, um, for the first portion, and then we'll pivot to Q&A. So if you have any questions at any time, put them in the chat. I'll call on you. You can ask your question uh, to Luke. Uh, and uh, if you want to be on YouTube, just indicate that and I'll read your question on your behalf. So that being said, Luke, welcome to the STOA. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be here with the STOA. Hello, everyone. I'm going to keep things nice and short to begin with, since I want to keep this very kind of interactive and iterative. The article, I'm guessing most of you may have already read, and if you want to, you can obviously read it uh, either while I'm talking or thereafter. But this is going to be more just a bit of a summary of that, as well as some other rough reflective thoughts. So first of all, it's probably worth briefly reflecting upon why a scholar who studies the end of the world, human extinction, is interested in emergency powers. I believe that when we think about existential risk, we often have a very simplistic worldview. We often have this kind of almost top 10 list of hazards, you know, ranging from nuclear weapons to climate change, etc. But to me, we're better off thinking about the overall level of risk, because most of these things will interact. And one of the things that will interact, of course, is how we respond. When you look at the most recent assessment report from the IPCC, they have a definition of risk, but they also have a definition of what they call response risk, which is essentially risks we incur when responding to the impacts of climate change. And I think we have to think of exactly the same thing when it comes to human extinction or existential risk or global catastrophe. We have to also take into account and think about what are the risks we incur when we respond to a unfolding calamity. And of course, COVID-19 is a pretty wonderful case study, although poor in many ways, for exactly that. The stomp reflex is essentially what I think is the prototypical and archetypal way that states and hierarchies respond to crises. It's essentially the use of emergency powers. Emergency powers are exceptional actions that countries can take to deviate away from existing laws and constitutions in the time of an emergency. Now, these vary quite dramatically by country, and many require a declaration of what's called a state of emergency. And just to give you a flavor how much they can vary, like in Germany, for instance, even when you, you can't have a state of emergency at a national level, you can only have it at a subnational level by region. And even those can actually not stop the right to assemble. On many other countries, you have national declarations of states of emergency, and you can very much stop the right to assemble. So these things do vary substantially. But the overall kind of conceptual idea of emergency powers is pretty much always the same. It, generally speaking, is a deviation away from existing laws, a suspension of many existing laws, and it tends to mean greater power to the executive rather than to the parliament, at least in parliamentary democracies. So what did we see during COVID? How did countries use emergency powers and states of emergency to respond to COVID? Well, we had 32 used either the military or military ordinances to enforce their rules. We had censorship tw across 28 countries and 128 contact, and tra contact tracing apps used across 71 countries. And overall, it appears that roughly 147 countries declared some form of a state of emergency during 2020, which as far as we can see is by far the largest amount of countries that ever declared simultaneously a state of emergency and made use of emergency powers. So COVID appears to be, at least as far as the last few centuries ago, the kind of greatest emergency in a way that we've had at least from a legal perspective. It's incurred the greatest overall use of emergency powers around the world. Now, 
Where do emergency powers come from? I think is an interesting question. One of the first examples we have of emergency powers is the Roman use of the dictator, which was essentially a temporary position, position that was given when Rome was under attack or under civil strife. So it was in response to warfare. The dictator had a fair amount of power and they didn't have to act with any approval by either the Senate or by the assembly. And they could do things like both try and execute citizens. They had control of the military and they could even issue emergency decrees. Despite that, there were some limits in terms of what the Roman dictator could do. First of all, they had a time limit for six months. And secondly, anything they did had to be approved by the senatorial budget if it required money. And thirdly, they weren't supposed to change the underlying institutions of the Roman Republic. Now, for roughly three centuries, the dictator office was used 95 times, and it doesn't appear to have had any erosion during that time. And a lot of this seems to be not just simply the limits they had placed upon the office, but also the fact that you had this really strong sense of public trust and virtue, that if you were going to be a dictator, despite the connotations we have of it now, you were supposed to be virtuous. You were supposed to do what needed to be done and leave office as soon as possible. You were not supposed to overreach in your use of powers. So Livy, the historian, uses an example of Cincinnatus, who was seen to be almost the kind of archetypal um, dictator that I should try to be. So Cincinnatus was a retired general who essentially lived on the outskirts of Rome. When I think it was the Celines um, attempted to, to invade Rome, he was called in as dictator. He took care of his job in 16 days and immediately left and went back to the field on his farm. He didn't first for power. He didn't look for prestige. He simply did his job as a dictator and returned to being a humble man. And this was kind of what was always expected of the dictator. But it seems that over time that norm kind of eroded. And eventually what you had was you had Sulla, who was the first dictator who both used more broad sweeping powers than he was supposed to, but also lasted a year rather than six months. Then, of course, we had everyone's favorite dictator, Julius Caesar, who also ended up being the last dictator since that marked the descent from the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire. But you see this quite frequently at different time periods, including both the Middle Ages, Middle, Middle Ages um, and the move away towards centralized governments, as well as the move from Weimar Republic into Nazi Germany. That what happened was there's an increasing use of emergency powers and a slow, steady erosion in what citizens expected from their public office. And eventually you have this kind of slow despotic drift from democracies or the at least more democratic type institutions towards autocracies. Now, for each of these, of course, there's a historical context. There's a whole bunch of other things to take into account, including, in many cases, increasing inequality. But nonetheless, emergency powers does seem to be something that has a long history and is frequently accompanied by, when it's abused, by a change in constitutions and governance structures towards more autocratic centralized forms. So there's good reasons to fear the new use of emergency powers. Do they work? Are they useful? Is a good question. In short, we don't know, but it appears probably not. So one thing I talk about in the article is the application of emergency powers thus far to COVID-19. And while some do appear to have been quite useful, so for example, lockdowns are almost always cropping up as one of the most effective ways to have stopped the spread and reduce the R rate of COVID-19, these were also things that citizens were already partially doing. So when you look at lockdown measures, they both have strong majority support, but also one recent that they showed that nearly half of the reductions in the transmission rate came from behavioral change before government imposed lockdowns were introduced. When it comes to emergency powers that are more kind of militarized, so things like the use of surveillance or the deployment of the military, the existing evidence suggests that these have not really been effective. And indeed, in general, we don't actually have much evidence that the use of mass surveillance in particular seems to help with most emergencies we encounter, whether it's microbes or terrorists. So the use of army interventions and surveillance measures, according to one Nature Human Behavior, Behavior article, were ranked in the bottom of seven, I'm sorry, of 20 surveyed measures. 
there's even actually one study which suggests that when you look at natural disasters and the use of constitutional emergency provisions, that essentially more, the higher the use of emergency powers to the executive, the higher the body count, even when you control for the size of the disaster. So in short, it does seem that in many cases, emergency powers kill rather than save. Now, why is this? Why is the emergency powers seem to have this kind of murky track record and why do they often lead towards this despotic drift? I think this is because emergency powers are built upon a vision of human nature in the world, which is inherently faulty. There's a really interesting mismatch between the kind of legalistic discussion of emergency powers, which often dates back to and refers back to kind of Roman law. And what we know from things like disaster risk management as a field, which is a study of how people and communities respond to natural disasters. When you look at disaster risk management, there's very strong evidence that when disasters hit, people by and large tend to respond through acts of mutual aid, spontaneous kind of organization, and exhibit very kind of pro-social and altruistic behavior. And you see this all over the place, whether it's directly after 9-11, you had people essentially start to commandeer uh, yachts and ships to, to move people away from Manhattan. Uh, you also had basically little pop-ups start emerging to take care of the victims, even before the federal government had time to respond. And this is also something we saw during COVID-19, ranging from people basically volunteering to buy groceries for people who are more vulnerable, hackathons for low-cost PPE, etc. Alongside that, there's very little evidence people actually engage in this kind of myth of mass panic. So in almost every disaster movie, we have this idea that people when a disaster strikes, will turn upon each other. It becomes anarchy. People are either screaming in the streets, or fighting over scarce resources, or just usually looking to engage in some kind of wanton violence. And we just don't have any evidence of that. This doesn't seem to happen. Indeed, at least like one book by Rebecca Solbert called A Paradise Built in Hell is just exactly the opposite, that people, when institutions crumble, natural disasters strike, tend to create almost kind of temporary utopias of sorts. And many after the disaster look back upon these times with a real kind of reverence and almost roast into glass of sorts, of sort. So people tend to respond quite well. Mass panic, as far as we know, is largely a myth. And yet the way that emergency powers work almost always works in just one way, and that's top down. It empowers people at the top of a hierarchy to stop panic and essentially, I guess in a way, autonomy at the lower levels. And to me, this is quite clear. This is built upon one particular idea of human nature. And this is this kind of mass panic, humans are bad myth. So to me, the stomp reflex, as I call it, the idea that emergencies need to be responded by empowering those at the top of hierarchy to stomp down those below is built more upon ideology rather than evidence. Now, I think we need to, over time, really reconsider how we're doing emergency powers and whether we should consider continue the stomp reflex. Both because we already have some early signs that the stomp reflex is leading towards this kind of despotic drift I've just spoken about. So look at, for instance, the United States, the use of emergency powers post 9-11 has essentially skyrocketed. And we've had the emergence of a very intrusive surveillance apparatus, which was at least partially unveiled by Edward Snowden in the 2013 revelations of the NSA. And this is, I think, a, a general process we see happening around the world that we have emergency powers leading to the empowerment of what I call the stalk complex. This combination of both firms and big tech working in surveillance capitalism, as well as intelligence agencies, both of whom have this very strong impulse to both make their citizens legible, to surveil them, and to use that data in some way to control and nudge them. So emergency powers, I do think, are increasing in use over time. And if we're thinking about existential risk, the thing I really worry about is if we warn policymakers about human extinction or catastrophe, that's going to increase the use of the stomp reflex, which potentially moves us maybe away from human extinction. I'm skeptical of that, but it certainly moves us more towards a more autocratic kind of surveilled world. What's the alternative? What I end the article with is a, a more speculative idea, which would be good to discuss a little bit, which is this notion of emergency emancipation, which is essentially the opposite of a stop reflex. Now, if we actually let people respond by and large in a fairly pro-social and effective way, 
with spontaneous coordination when disaster strikes. We should try to harness and make the use of that rather than just try to empower those at a hierarchy who are actually much more likely to screw things up by sending the military. How would that look like? Well, there's a number of different things you could do. Parts of this have already been in ways rolled out by countries like Taiwan, who is a bit of a success story. It's only had, I think, 10 fatalities to date so far. When you look at the way Taiwan handled the COVID-19 crisis, in spite of a whole bunch of top-down measures, they also had some very interesting, innovative bottom-up ones. So for instance, Taiwan did shut its border borders early and reacted very early. And that was because essentially a health minister or a health official, I should say, was, I think on, was on Reddit or another online platform was basically saw a whole bunch of posts talking about a mysterious disease in Wuhan. And they basically took the most highly rated post, discussed it in-house, and that became, ended up being their uh, trigger for taking early action. So they actually used insider accounts and discussions from citizens in order to actually act early, which is a very stark contrast to China, which did exactly the opposite, right? Where they actually tried to penalize whistleblowers and stop any information about the disease coming outside of, outside of citizens. It also had a number of measures such as, I believe they had a kind of a citizen scoped open source apps where basically asked citizen hackers to put together open source apps which show the distribution of PPE and masks since those were running out of stock into pharmacies. This basically helped create an interactive map so people could pick out which pharmacies were in stock, which were out of stock. So this is just like two very small examples of how you can actually involve citizens and help them to go help you help governments to, to respond to disasters. And there's a whole bunch of other ones you can think of. You know, for instance, why not have it that as soon as we have wind of a disaster, you call an emergency jury of randomly selected citizens by lottery. You know, we know that these kind of a what we call lottery systems, whether it be for an assembly or for a jury, tend to work very well. We have a whole bunch of both practical case studies like the abortion debate in Ireland, um, as well as the climate change assembly in France, as well as a very large academic body of literature. And it is just overwhelming amount of evidence that when you give citizens who are randomly picked from the population good evidence and time to deliberate, they tend to come to very good judgments. So why don't we just simply have that either as a preparation for di disasters we know will come eventually, things like emergency nautic infections and the next pandemic, or have a system in place in which we have that as a rapid response. And to have it totally transparent, have the discussions be live streamed to the citizens, for instance. That would build a lot of public trust in the measures that are taken. And we know the public trust is incredibly important. If you look at Denmark, for instance, one of the countries that's been most successful in responding to COVID-19, the health minister put most of the success down to certain levels of public trust, which in Denmark are far higher than in the US. So in short, I think we need to thoroughly rethink how we respond to emergencies and how we respond to crises. We need to move away from the stomp reflex towards this model of emergency emancipation. Otherwise, in the long term, my greatest fear is not that we're going to have an inadequate response to crises or that there is a problem, but they're going to have a slow despotic drift. And this time it won't be happening within a country like a single area like Rome. It'll be happening at a global level. I'll close it up here for now and open things for discussion. Awesome. Yeah, that's some really good stuff, uh, Luke, and uh, um, really great article. So if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Uh, start putting your questions in the chat. I'll call on you. You're going to meet yourself and ask your question to Luke. Uh, I'll warm Luke up with two questions of my own. Um, so, yeah, your article partly inspired uh, me to write a piece called The, the Most Hellish Scenario of the Meta Crisis. Um, mm -hmm. And it's uh, the, the World in Chains uh, scenario that you mentioned in the piece. And and I kind of like, and I really like what you said about how like talking about to about uh, existential risk to government officials actually like scares them more and could influence this uh, stop reflex to uh, come online. And that's why I really like the, the suffering risk uh, uh, kind of um, coinage because it talks about how not necessarily uh, uh, things could happen that make us go extinct, but could, things could lead us to a hellish existence like the world of change uh, scenario. Um, so I'm curious if you can talk about how uh, suffering risk is, is being spoken about uh, in your circles and maybe just any general thoughts on the world of uh, world and change scenario. 
Yeah, so the relationship between existential risk scholars and stuff from risk are kind of what they often call lock-in scenarios. So scenarios in which you lock in an autocratic or at the very least undesirable global regime is complicated. So on the one hand, people are definitely aware of it and we do have some who are focused on talking about suffering risk. Suffering risk right now tends to be usually more focused towards scenarios in which you have the creation of an artificial general intelligence. So an AI system that is so advanced that it's essentially comparable in the breadth of its powers to the average human. I'm just gonna quickly plug in my laptop. Give me 10 seconds. We should have a plug in laptop music during these moments. Uh, so <laughs> the recommendation in the chat. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, so usually suffering risk is referred to for these AGI scenarios. We have the creation of a super intelligence that essentially takes over the world and has the wrong goals built into it and essentially decides to make everyone suffer in some way or another. I think that to me, this is much more about the notion of lock in. Do we have the capabilities through things like facial recognition, surveillance, et cetera, that we start to enter scenarios in which we have autocratic regimes that are far more stable and enduring than we had previously? There's a lot of debate about this. Um, so some such as Toby Ord are quite worried about this. Others like uh, under Sunberg is on analysis suggesting we probably shouldn't be we're so worried because these regimes tend to prove to be quite unstable and individual leaders even if they have access to life extension technology, tend to usually get killed early on um, by assassination or two or something like that. We also, on the other hand, have, I think, scholars in the field who are probably slightly pushing us towards a lock in risk. So one of the things that prompted me to write this article was a paper by uh, a philosopher called Nick Bostrom here in Oxford, who did a paper called the vulnerable world hypothesis, which essentially puts forward the hypothesis that there could be different technological innovations that essentially destroy the world by default. And one of the examples he gives amongst four is that of easy nukes. So we develop a technology which essentially is very widely accessible and dispersed and is capable of doing mass destruction. So easy nukes in this case would be imagine if you could take sand, put it in a microwave, and that is a nuclear device. And his argument, of course, is that there'll be at least one person amongst the population who is irrational or vengeful or malevolent or unhinged enough to do so. And that would trigger a chain, re chain reaction. And his argument is under this scenario, the only way in which you can stop catastrophe is by having intrusive ubiquitous surveillance and extreme preventative police. So yeah, there's a kind of little vignette here of people wearing freedom tags, very Orwellian terminology, which constantly watches people to make sure they can't go and use the easy nook. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of problems here. The most obvious one is that we shouldn't be basing either policy or science upon kind of far-flung thought experiments. I mean, we don't really have any evidence that easy nukes are around the corner. And indeed, the way technology emerges tends to be that we actively try to build certain things rather than these technologies just kind of emerging out of the ever. On top of that, you know, there's also good evidence that most of the worst existential risks are being built by governments and by large corporations. And it'd be quite odd actually for the response to be, let's put citizens under surveillance and who's controlling the surveillance apparatus? Well, likely those who are actually creating existential risk in the first place, whether it's big tech or governments. Um, so I think there's a whole bunch of problems there in short, but I'm getting distracted here. But anyway, the, the short answer is that some scholars in the field, I think, have in some ways actually pushed a little bit for the world and change to the scenario. They think that we need to have surveillance and we potentially need to have ubiquitous policing in order to prevent existential risk. Others are much more worried about it. In general, I don't think we have a good enough grip upon whether or not a regime could be stable enough to be a, a total lock-in or to cause a suffering risk. But in a way, I don't think that matters too much. I think that we have a responsibility and a duty if we're talking about extinction risk to also think about how our advice can be misused. 
and to me, this is the biggest one, is that global threats provide the impetus for having this despotic drift on a global level. Mm -hmm. so, so my other question, uh, and this might be a controversial one, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll be delicate here, and we can always edit it out too if we, <laughs> if we don't want it, um, but I, I've studied uh, a lot of narrative warfare, mimetic warfare, and at least here in Canada, US, and especially in the context of talking about COVID, you even gesture towards um, like uh, governments abusing emergency powers, you'd be pattern matches, some kind of conspiracy theorist. Um, and by looking at the mimetic landscape, there seems to be like to be charitable to the, the narratives that exist. There seems to be an active emergent and engineered conspiracy, like this technocratic elites are installing a VAX passport system to set up a digital ID, to set up a social credit system for greater top-down control. Um, and so instead of like a world of change, it's like an Alex Jones prison planet type thing. Um, and so I'm curious how uh, uh, you're navigating this space, if you came across any of these difficulties um, and just generally any thoughts uh, on anything I said. Yeah, it's an incredibly difficult space to navigate for that exact reason that I think there's both genuine causes for concern when it comes to thinking about emergency powers, but there is obviously a very vibrant and active <laughs> conspiracy theory community as well. One of the problems here is that, you know, many conspiracy theories or things that seem to be conspiracy theories end up being true. You know, look at the NSA, for instance, and what was revealed in 2013. In a way, you don't really need to have conspiracy theories. And I've always been frustrated that people turn towards these really weird, far far conspiracies of lizard men controlling the population when we already had some pretty good evidence of you know well the nsa doing incredibly unconstitutional things in order to have mass surveillance we already have evidence that you know the us and this is very clearly documented now through confidential um previously confidential sources that the us engaged with different forms of cloud seeding and geoengineering during the vietnam war as part of its kind of warfare efforts we don't really need conspiracies and they do unfortunately muddle the territory when it comes to emergency powers. And that was something I was very aware of in writing this piece. It was something that was difficult to do. I think this usually requires a large level of nuance. And so for me, this is really about saying, look, when it comes to things like vaccine passports, we don't need a conspiracy to know that we should always be careful in giving states a new tool of control over its citizens. And this is not to say vaccine passports are good or bad, more so that the way in which we enact these emergency measures is very important. And so for me, it's less important whether an individual is kind of pro or con vaccine passports, much more important, how do we actually institute them? And these drastic messages shouldn't be instituted in a top-down technocratic and opaque way. So in short, it's difficult, it's a tricky topic. It's one we have to grapple with. And I think that it's one where we need to often think more about these big questions of what's the process rather than, you know, is this being done by a evil cabal of actors? Um, I'm not sure that direct answers your question directly, but. Yeah, and that, that's, I was thought you were gonna say an evil cabal of reptilians, but uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I, do, I do agree um, that the term conspiracy theory is used as sort of like a, a thought terminating cliche, it just shuts down valid conversation that that needs to happen on unreal kind of parapolitical machinations that may be occurring and i think your article did it really like did that balance really well that's why i invited you to the, not this so discuss about it um so uh uh let's take in yuli yuli our uh, effective altruist here in toronto uh yuli had a question to luke hi luke thanks for coming um so the question i'm gonna pose out of the many questions i've thrown into the chat um, so this one is going to be oriented towards like, I want to find the boundaries of your argument so that we can better orient towards what makes sense as a response. Um, and then, and then I will add a question to that, that, um, is less probing about the boundaries and more of like a whimsical, like, oh, looking at the structure of this argument, is there some kind of opposite that we can look to, um, which might help us think about different like solutions. Okay. And here's the question. Um, are there scenarios like like basically you're saying that there's going to be despotic drift and I'm and I'm asking the question of um, are there situations where the opposite has occurred are there outliers in the mm -hmm. data you've looked at such that somehow the use of emergency powers leads to actually more resilience in democratic function and then so that's the first question to explore the boundaries and then the follow-up to that 
is something like, um, can you think of specific ways in which we might use the very things that are hampering us right now, the very things that we might be afraid of seeing, uh, seeing more of, such as surveillance, um, as tools to increase democracy? Is there such a thing as decentralized surveillance or, or something like that? Very good questions and very large, big meta questions. I like it. So for the first questions, it's difficult because there's no kind of clear criteria we can have here for, you know, what is a vibrant democracy? And so it's hard to kind of compare and measure when has an emergency power and usage led to a more vibrant democracy. To my mind, one obvious example would be the use of emergency powers during World War II, where arguably this did help the war effort. And it helped to ensure that countries that were at least against Germany stayed democratic. Even that is a very difficult case insofar as what you did see happen to most European countries, including Switzerland, the UK, et cetera, is there was an increasing amount in centralization of power in the executive away from the parliament. So it's mixed. Arguably, these may have been helpful in the war effort. Even then, we don't have a counterfactual, so we don't really know. And it still did seem to lead to some slow undermining of the balance between the executive and the parliament. Potentially the Roman Republic, at least for a short period of time, we can say that these emergency powers seem to have been helpful in terms of both ensuring the Roman Republic continued to exist. Once again, assuming that they were effective and we don't have to know that. But there also are arguments with people like Machiavelli and Machiavelli's argument in, I think, the discourse and Levy is that these essentially acted as a pressure valve, that having citizens live for six months under a dictator, let them know how important it was to actually have the assembly, to actually have some say in political participation in the Republic. And so at least in Machiavelli's eyes, the use of emergency powers and the dictator in the Roman Republic actually helped to ensure citizens wanted to keep the Republic intact. That's a philosophical argument. It's, it's what I'm skeptical of because of course, eventually this did lead to some kind of despotic drift. Uh, so in short, not really sure. Those are the two best examples I can think of. And even those are both quite mixed and it's hard to tell whether emergency powers were actually effective in terms of helping the war effort or helping defend the state. And question number two was, just briefly remind me. Uh, so that was something like, are there ways to use the very specific threats, and we may think of like increased mm. surveillance as, a, as an example, yeah. uh, to actually uh, do the thing that we're looking to protect? Is there something uh, about surveillance technology today that can actually be used to uh, increase uh, decentralization uh, or, or democratic functioning? Yeah, of course. I mean, you could have some form of like bottom-up surveillance, essentially, where every single politician has a far tighter level of surveillance. We know exactly what's being said when they go to meet with donors, for instance. We know exactly what's being said when it comes to usually opaque meetings, such as the SAGE meeting at the beginning of the pandemic. So there's ways of using surveillance to actually give citizens greater legibility and insight into their governments rather than vice versa. That being said, we have to always bear in mind when technologies are created, of course, they have multiple uses, but the way they're used is almost always reflective, at least to me, of the power structures they're birthed by. And what we tend to see happening here, both historically as well as in the present day, is that when surveillance technologies are created, they're usually created in such a way that disproportionately benefits the power and is obviously used by the powerful as well. Um, we also say this when it comes to things like the internet, right? Like when the internet first came online, there's this big anarchist dream that it would be used to kind of have this very large decentralized network of knowledge and democracy and governance. And that's been partially true in some ways, but the same way, the way the internet is now conducted and kind of used, it's you know, a combination of surveillance capitalism and a playground for GCHQ and the NSA. Um, so it was eventually captured kind of used for existing power structures. So. I think that's something we have to always bear in mind is that technology is not born to a vacuum. They're born into certain distributions of power. And right now, while I can think of theoretical and hypothetical ways in which surveillance technologies could be used to help with emergency emancipation rather than the stomp reflex, the default condition is they're going to be used for the stomp reflex and not for emergency, emergency emancipation. So when we have facial recognition and other technologies being created, the de facto situation I think right now is they're going to be useless stop reflex. They're going to be used by the stock complex 
they won't be used by citizens. But of course, in a kind of alternative world, hypothetically, they could be used. Um, I have one follow up, Peter, if that's okay with yep. you. Okay, awesome. So, um, yeah, it really, it really stood out to me that the way you're saying, well, <clears throat> the power distribution dictates normally how the technologies are used. And I saw Flavio's uh, comment in the chat, and he was asking about like, what, what's a stomp reflex in a smaller context, so maybe like a family or a company. And then, um, mm. I, I, I guess this got me thinking of like, what, what's the counterfactual here? So um, maybe in a family, you might imagine that like if there's if there's a power distribution and one person doesn't get to take a very specific uh, uh, dictatorial action or very top down authorita uh, authoritative action, Tarion, one of the two. Um, and so he doesn't get to like let's say you know the father of a specific household who's who's actually doing something that's not good for the for the family overall for the family dynamic. And so if they don't get to take that action. Are they going to do something worse instead? Was it was there like an underlying desire to actually exert that control anyway? And now I, I want to caveat my question with I, I actually personally anyway, I'm very on board for, for keeping careful track of how our surveillance technologies are used, for example. But I still want to ask the question of what's the what's the default mode of things that happens without emergency powers? Are um are the organizations we're looking to and saying these organizations are going to get more power are they normally gaining power anyway and is this just like a trivial sort of reason and excuse um, for something that would have happened anyway um, and and that i feel is going to help to set the background context against which we can actually compare the impacts of these specific uses of emergency powers and that will give us more clarity about what we have to do i think that's an incredibly important and pressing question so Longer answer, and but I just think it's important to place this all into context. So my other work is largely on societal collapse and transformation. So trying to look towards the historical record, thinking through how have states and civilizations collapsed, and what can they tell us about the future? One important piece of work, potentially one of the most important I've ever read, is Walter Scheidel's The Great Leveler. And Walter's a colleague of mine. He's a professor of both social anthropology and history at Stanford University. And The Great Leveler is essentially an empirical investigation of how has inequality changed in different states across time. And the robust empirical answer is that it increases over time until you have a great leveler. And the great levelers are a state collapse, mass mobilization warfare, like World War I and World War II, a bloody revolution, so think of the Bolshevik revolution, or a pandemic, so think of the Black Death. Outside of those, we only have two case studies in which inequality either stagnated or went backwards without having this kind of violent rupture. One of those is Sweden in the interbellum period when you had the representation of workers in the parliament and unions in the parliament, and the other is Athenian democracy. Now, both of those eventually still, it appears, ended up having increasing inequality over time, but at least for a short period of time, certain governance changes appeared to have stopped inequality. But otherwise, it's one of the most strong, robust institutional uh, trends we have in the long durée is that inequality increases over time until a great level occurs. What I think happened in Rome, and this is, I think, what happens in, with despotic drift in general, including what happened in the Weimar Republic, is that you have increasing inequality in a country and and then eventually the use of emergency powers essentially kind of accelerates the problems incurred by that, including usually increasing amounts of centralization and an increasing kind of drift towards autocracy. And I think that's largely why the citizens of Rome started losing faith in the public trust in the dictator was because they started to slowly feel like the Roman Republic was no longer actually playing attention to the pledge anyway. So why bother actually holding the dictator to account it didn't really matter anyway. You actually see this, I think, in the modern world, world as well, where people increasingly feel despondent towards what's happening. You know, look at the Pandora Papers after the Panama Papers. People are now just kind of just accepted that tax evasion is going to happen, unfortunately, we just get used to it. So I see, personally, emergency powers as being an accelerant to an existing trend. Another important kind of caveat here is that a really good book I'd recommend is The Decline and Rise of Democracy by David Stasavich. 
who is a professor of political science at New York University. It's essentially a global history of democracy from antiquity to the modern age. The key things that he puts forward as to what leads to democracy are distributed violence. So Switzerland had this very famous saying of one man, one gun, one vote during World, during World II. The state capacity, so weaker states tend to actually lead to more democracy because very strong bureaucratic states tend to have a greater ability to control their citizens and hence the state has less willingness or need to listen to its citizens in the first place. When the state can't control its citizens, they need to negotiate with them in order to actually get taxation or to have their corporation. And exit options, the ability to actually lead a state, leave a state if you don't like it. And I mean, exit options, we can basically get rid of, there's very few of those anymore. Distributed means of violence appears to be headed the other way. Most militaries are becoming increasingly centralized and relied upon technology. And when it comes to state capacity, I mean, to the earliest emperors, whether it was Sargon or Julius Caesar, the amount of control that the modern state had would be a wet dream. And I think that's something to bear in mind is that these, that trend as well, when it comes to state capacity and the ability for a state to survey and control its citizens, what James Scott was called, was called seeing like a state, that is constantly increasing. So between the increasing capacity of the state and the increasing inequality, I think those are the two main trends we really need to worry about. And what happens is emergency powers actually just simply accelerate those pre existing trends. But nonetheless, the accelerant and the kind of those nonlinear effects are important and need to be paid attention to. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to follow up with you a bit more in person. Thank you for giving me these threads. This is wonderful. Um, let's see if we can sneak in two more questions. Uh, Jenny, you had a question. I can tell you next. Okay, yeah. So my question is about how we're defining emergency. It seems like we're, we're assuming that, sure. yes, for sure, it's an emergency. And something like 9-11, the planes crashed into the towers. Yes, it's an emergency. Sometimes, I don't know, I'm going to skip COVID because I don't want to go there. But my example was um, somebody named Bjorn Lomborg. He argues that climate change is not an emergency. It's a problem. It's a big problem. But by defining it as an emergency and putting everything towards it, we might be ignoring some other things that could be important and in the end causing more harm than good. So how do we all agree that yes, this is an emergency. We need to put everything against it. In short, first of all, great question, Jenny. Uh, in short, we don't. It's the act of a small political class to define what the emergency is. In the scholarship on emergency powers in the Middle, Middle Ages, when the kind of Middle Age scholars came across the Latin text from the Roman Republic um, talking about emergency powers, they basically started to formulate some rough ideas of what to constitute emergency. And they usually said it needed to be immediate, it needed to be evident. So it needed to be essentially something that everyone could agree was actually occurring. And it needed to be about public security. It needed to be essentially in the public interest. It couldn't be a threat to an individual or a small part of society. The way the countries define it now tends to be well varied. Different countries have different thresholds when you can declare a state of emergency. But in general, it still tends to apply to those kind of basic, basic kind of uh, principles that you need to have it to be evident, immediate, and in some way about public interest. But in short, right now, we just don't really have any good mechanism for knowing what an emergency is and what it isn't. And that, of course, is one of the problems, is that we can start to manufacture emergencies to a certain extent. And one of the things I mentioned in the article that I haven't mentioned so far is that I think one of the more pernicious changes has been this shift from emergency powers being used for very particular emergencies towards what I call emergency responses, which are legislation normal legislation, which is passed through the parliament and normal use of powers, which aren't classified as emergency powers, but in terms of their content are just as bad, if not worse. And so when you look at the, say, for example, what is it, police crimes and sentencing bill in the UK, some of the measures in that are by most kind of considerations an emergency power, basically. Uh, what's the emergency? The Johnson government's very upset about climate change activists in the streets. 
kind of hard to you know define that as emergency, but the response nonetheless seems to border upon emergency power. So in short, it's fuzzy. Who gets to decide is the powerful, and that is one of the problems. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, Flavius, you had a question. Thank you. Um, this is so interesting. I was, can you hear me well there? Yeah. Good. As I was, well, Yuli also mentioned about, like, I was thinking of smaller systems as well, and families and, and even individuals, like we have, each one of us has several complexes and, and when there's some an emergency with this there's this I think my question is how do we kind of what do we do about this concept of this kind of virus that tells you when there's an emergency you should um, act, activate you should become more hierarchical more mm -hmm. Uh, I see that also, yeah, uh, there was an accident in the 77 that was like the deadliest aviation accident. Uh, there was this emergency in Canaria Islands and lots of planes had been, there was an, uh, yeah, a terrorist attack. It was, the, it was a very bad accident and the, the, when they studied why, uh, the, the kind of the reaction of, of the one of the, one of the planes was kind of become more hierarchical. There was this this pilot uh, deciding, yeah, we have to 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 take off, and ignored the, the opinion of the the crew member who thought there might be a problem and we might crash into another airplane. And the, the conclusion of this of this accident was we need to tone down hierarchy. When there's an emergency, when there's there's a critical moment, and in, in the cockpit there's always critical things. So we need to down hierarchies. Uh, I think my question is how how are we doing that? Not just in a societal level, but in a smaller, like even family structures and even individual structures within ourselves. Because also, I've been sick now uh, for a while with long COVID, and and my first reaction was kind of okay, this is an emergency. I need to be, be very happy. This part of me, which is rational, needs to take all of the decisions, and and that wasn't been, hasn't been helpful. And in my family too, I've seen that. Like my father got ill, and so my mother was like the one deciding. And this wasn't helpful. It's like I mm. I feel like when more emergency there is, the more we need to tone down and kind of find a consensus, right? And so I want to know if there's because it 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 can prove very helpful for for from both ways, from the society that small. Yeah, so does this, the storm prefix work and function for entities outside of the state? So does it work for families? Does it happen to organizations and companies, et cetera? And what can we do, of course, in those cases to battle against it? In short, the answer is I don't know. Empirically, I haven't looked deeply enough into what's the actual evidence that this is something that's much more deeply rooted than just being some a kind of relic of Roman law. I have my suspicions that it is more deeply rooted. So if you look at some of the work of, I think his name is Brian, is it Brian Fagan or Brian Fry? He's an archaeologist, an anthropologist who looks at violence, but in particular, he had had a recent good study on violence in the earlier states, essentially Mesopotamia. And his argument is that when you look at things archaeologically, essentially in the Mesopotamian city-states where you kind of had the emergence of the first empires, the empire of Sargon, you didn't have any evidence of large-scale warfare or walls until you had the pharaoh, so uh, dynasty zero, in ancient Egypt pop up. Once you had a state with a, mil with a military south of Mesopotamia, all of a sudden, they start to develop much more hierarchical structures. They start to develop military walls, etc. And we also have evidence of the stomp reflex in kind of more complex hunter gatherers, if you will, or at the very least um, non-state societies. So if you look at the Iroquois, for instance, they actually had a setup in which was 
surprisingly similar to the Roman dictator, where essentially a war chief would more or less take charge during periods of warfare. There was still, of course, a whole bunch of limitations upon that. They still had assemblies and whatnot, but nonetheless, there was a suspension of the usual conduct. And one individual, usually a great warrior, was given a disproportionate amount of power during that emergency, during that war. So there does seem to be evidence that this is something surprisingly widespread, if not ubiquitous, that when faced with an external threat, we're much more likely and willing to give up sovereignty to others in order to basically respond to that. That's something that's highly uncertain. As mentioned, I haven't come across any good like psychological mechanisms or empirical data for it, but I think there's reasons to believe that may be the case. Does it happen at a lower level? Again, speculation, I suspect it does to a certain extent. So when, again, when you look at state formation in places like Mesopotamia, apart from the rise of external military threats, one of the other things that seems to precede the formation of militaries and states is inequality at the kind of familial level, both between genders as well as between kind of youngers and elders. And there's another good book called The Creation of Social Inequality, which basically their argument they put forward is that most hunter-gatherers usually have some kind of very small hierarchies, whether it's in their cosmology or whether it's in the relationship between children and adults. And eventually those hierarchies get extended. The social logic gets kind of tinkered with to justify something like a state, to justify more and more hierarchy over time. So in short, I do think that there is most likely this kind of stomp reflex impulse in other entities outside of states. I'm not sure exactly how it works and why. And I think that's actually a really important area of study. And in terms of stopping it, I think it ends up being exactly the same as kind of my notion of emergency emancipation, that you start to have to set up, whether it be a family or a company, in such ways that when we face emergencies, rather than being willing to derogate away from existing rules and kind of delegate more power to those atop a hierarchy, we should actually be, if anything, much more vigilant and much more willing to hopefully take decisions in the most democratic fashion possible. Because it's during emergencies that, of course, it seems the hierarchy is the most dangerous. Awesome. Thank you, Flavius. Um, so we're almost at the top of the hour, so we'll, we'll close here. Um, I'd like to hand it to to Luke for any closing thoughts. And, and perhaps I'm curious, um, like maybe you can speak a little bit about the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and the, the current work that you are um, researching. Sure. So as mentioned, I'm a research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, CESA, at the University of Cambridge. Ooh, our work covers a very large number of different areas, ranging from the governance and kind of safety of AI through to uh, by biological weapons, bioterrorism, and in general, biosecurity. And a fair bit of my work covers both collapse, so trying to understand how complex systems both respond to crises and collapse and what we can potentially learn from the past to think about the future, and also climate, um, and in particular, trying to understand what are the potential ways in which climate change has knock-on effects that could lead to a global catastrophe. Um, and quite a lot of my work at this stage is really more about trying to think of different ways to actually examine and investigate existential risk. Because I think that this current way that we have where we basically say, I'm going to pick a couple of hazards and for no reason will be AI and nuclear weapons and climate and a few other ones which I think are really glorious. And to really think about risk in the more typical sense, which is risk is both a hazard of vulnerability and exposure, to think about risks from responses, so the stop reflex, as I mentioned, but also to think about the overall liberal risk. To me, risk is not something that comes from individuals, technologies birthed into the void. It's really about an overall level of risk created by certain institutional structures. So for me, it's much less about, say, for example, nuclear war and AI, and much more about arms races. It's less about climate change and much more about the extractive relationship between heavy industry and the planet. So hopefully that's uh, fairly useful. As mentioned, if you want to get in touch with me, please feel free to give me an email. I'm very happy to follow up. And thank you, Peter, for hosting, and thank you all for joining. Awesome.
Uh, I'll make some uh, closing announcements in a moment, but uh, Luke, thank you so much. Love the article, love your work, uh, and really appreciate what you're doing in the world. So keep it up and love to have you back at, at the store anytime. Um, I'll, I'll plug two quickly, two quick events uh, tomorrow. At the same time, we have Doing Philosophy. Uh, the, the, someone from the Practical Philosophy Movement is coming in to talk us how we can apply philosophy to uh, our everyday life. And Yuli has an event coming up actually on uh, uh, how being in a monastery uh, could help with existential risk. So perhaps you can plug that event, Yuli. Sure. I'm a huge fan of a multi-pronged approach to trying to uh, have a relationship to the world's problems, where I think effective altruism directly, in, in particular, like the very nuanced uh, research working with the highest levels of institution, such as uh, CSAT, um, is a vital part of the process. And I think that there are more bottom-up solutions that come from the individual and that individual working on themselves and that being connected with a broader set of networks, for example, Effective Altruism in Toronto or even the STOA, um, all being vital parts of how it is that we can most effectively orient to the massive amount of challenge that we're facing today as a species. Um, so uh, on October 20th, uh, Vera Padra and I are going to speak a little bit about um, what is modern monastic practice as a response to existential risk uh, in the planet? What does that mean for how we're cultivating ourselves, our friendships, and our communities? And how does that play out in the broader scale of how we want to respond to these grand challenges? Awesome. Thanks, Julie. And you can go to the store.ca to RSV to all events. So that being said, Luke, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today.